In episode 1 of The Fall of the House of Usher, titled A Midnight Dreary, which happens to be the famous line from Raven Nevermore, we meet the Usher family as the wealthy CEO faces a criminal investigation amid tragedy, trauma, and a supernatural threat. The Usher family learns that an informant lurks amongst them. As we open this show with quick flashes of a party set in 1980, we see a stone wall, a raven, and a smiling demon. Which leads us into this funeral of three people that we'll later meet in this episode as this mysterious figure watches from the balcony. We learn that the Usher family has been attached to a string of recent deaths, either brutally murdered or died of an apparent suicide, and according to the post-it notes, they all died a little over a week apart. Leaving only Roderick and his granddaughter, his sister Madeline and Arthur Pym, their family attorney, as the last one standing but also potential suspects. Assistant U.S. Attorney Charles Dupin, who has been investigating this family for most of his career, he gets a personal invitation from Roderick Usher to meet at this mysterious location. After years of working to catch him, he finally gets the opportunity to speak with him directly with no attorneys present, no following protocols, just a confession from Roderick Usher himself. We learn this location is actually where Roderick and his sister grew up as he bought the whole neighborhood for moments just like this to use as a pick-me-up. Now Roderick has over 73 charges and he's willing to confess to them all and even give Depend a bonus which is the actual truth behind how his children actually died. But first, we must start from the beginning. We meet his mother, Eliza, who shares the same name of Agar Allen's Poe's mother, who is a personal secretary of the CEO of Fortunato Pharmaceuticals, William Longfellow. Her mother had one rule, and that was Madeline and Roderick to never come to Longfellow's house, who lived on the same block as them. But Madeline convinced her brother to sneaking over and hopping over their fence. As Roderick slips and falls and is caught by Longfellow and his mother finally arrives, he whispers to her that they were told to never come to this house. As it is implied in this scene, and later confirmed in this episode, he was the father of the two kids and clearly disowned them and kept this relationship a secret. This wasn't confirmed in this episode, but one would assume that the truth eventually came out that he was their father and they eventually probably inherited the company a little bit later in their lives and that's where all their fortune came from. Cut to 1962, where Eliza is now sick and she refuses to see a doctor. Now, Madeline always knew about her mother and her father as her and her brother went to his house for help, even though this was against their mother's orders. Unfortunately, Longfellow wasn't a man of morals or care as he doesn't help them and eventually their mother dies. Their mother refused for them to get anyone involved in this matter as the kids are left to burying her in the backyard alone. Definitely makes you feel a level of sympathy for the kids at this young age as they were tasked to do this without any help. But on a stormy night, they find their mother is missing from her grave as footsteps lead to their home. As they believe they might have made a mistake by burying their mother who might have still been alive as she arrives in the shadows of the dark and grabs and chokes her son against the wall as he apologizes. As she appears to clearly be dead, but we never learn this episode how and why she was able to rise from the dead, but one would imagine it fits into a very similar theme in Edgar Allan Poe's stories, which is revenge. As she eventually releases her son and she heads directly over to Longfellow's house, she ends up killing him in front of his wife. Now back to the confession, the story went that Longfellow died of an apparent heart attack as this was a cover up by Roderick once he got older. Now this was a secret that Carrie with them and unlike Edgar Allan Poe whose mother died when he was young which caused his siblings to split up, but in this case Roderick and his sister Madeline stayed together and they loved their mother even more after killing their father from the grave. Dupin doesn't understand why he's telling him the story of his dead mother, as Roderick tells him because she's right behind him. Dupin believes this is a power tactic and he doesn't want to turn around and look, but as we the audience see, there was definitely someone standing behind him, which was a great effect. Now Roderick believed the opposite of Longfellow, and if you were an usher, you were welcome to the family. As he has six kids by five different women, this was a matter of principle for him. As we cut to two weeks ago, the last time the usher family was in the same place alive as is in a courtroom for the most meaningful pharmaceutical prosecution in history. We see the family in court as Charles gives his opening arguments, arguments that impress Roderick himself. Not in 40 years, the Usher family has not been found guilty of literally anything, not even a speeding ticket. But this time is different. This time, Charles tells the judge and jury that a family member is ready to speak against the family in this case, which shocks everyone in the courtroom, including the enforcer Pym, as Charles has to withhold the identity of this informant for now. 
As we get a variety of scenes of showing the different family members trying to guess who the rat is, this clearly shows the lack of trust they have in one another, but also they want to find who the rat is to impress their dad. As we meet the rest of the Usher family, we have Frederick Usher and his family, who's the oldest son. We meet Tamerlane, who's the oldest daughter, and we also meet her husband, William. We meet Victorine, who is the oldest of Roderick's illegitimate children, and her girlfriend, Al. We have Napoleon Usher, who's also one of Roderick's illegitimate children. We meet Camilla, who is one of Roderick's illegitimate children as well, but she's also working in the public relations of the company. We have Prospero Usher, who's the youngest of Roderick's illegitimate children. And we end with Juno Usher, who is the second wife of Roderick, who apparently is a former drug addict. Now you'll notice that most of the main characters are named after Edgar Allan Poe's work, which probably gives us an indicator how they're going to end up dying. I'm going to say now, this cast and the acting has been excellent so far, as Roderick gathers the family for a meeting, but before that, we see that he gets a scare from that mysterious person that was at the funeral. Now Pym, as they call him, Pym the Reaper, gives the family and the kids a non-disclosure agreement to sign, which shows their loyalty to the family. To me, this scene perfectly showcases the witty and hilarious writing so far and the back and forth banter of this cast which has been phenomenal but it also shows the distrust and the hostility between them but more importantly every actor seems to be perfectly casted in their respective roles. As Roderick puts a 50 million dollar bounty on the rat and whoever finds this rat wins the money. It's important to note this was the last time he saw all of them together alive. Now back with the conversation with Dupin, Roderick claims that he's responsible for the death of his children and he wants to tell him about the woman and true resolution. As we cut to the last day of 1979 leading to New Year's of 1980, we meet the adult versions of Roderick and Madeline. Now this is where they meet Verna, aka the Raven. Now it's clear as day that they have done something bad as they're using this bar visit as an alibi for their whereabouts for whatever they've done. This was the night that the company completely changed, but the question is, what actually happened that night? see Werner talking to them about sitting outside of time and space as it seems like they're making some type of offering or some type of deal, almost like they're making a deal with the devil, as his mother, his children, and the party are very important to his confession. As we end the episode heading back to the funeral, she's here. Roderick knows this and sees all of his dead children looking down upon him. Roderick enters his car and sees a figure dressed as a jester as he passes out and a raving's looking down upon him as it is time. This gesture would point towards the cast on Mascalano, which is a story of a man named Antresto who decides to seek revenge again named Fortunato who insults him. It might be a similar story to what we got after this episode 1, someone seeking revenge. In episode 2 of The Fall of the House of Usher, which was titled The Mask of the Red Death, which is another important title that ties directly into a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, and later in his recap, I'll explain the connection to that story and Perry's horrific fate. As he's motivated in this episode by money and revenge, we see Perry hosting an exclusive masquerade that takes a very twisted turn. Meanwhile, we have a young Roderick who's pitching a revolutionary new opioid. Now, we open this episode with Dupin in 1979 as he's investigating and taking photos of the fifth case of a dead person missing from their grave. Now during this time he was a junior fraud investigator as his boss is upset with his tactics as he occasionally leads people on to thinking that he's a police detective. Now they have a disagreement about his methods as we see that he's been fighting the good fight for the people he believes are getting taken advantage of in the pharmaceutical industry for a very long time. We cut back to the conversation between Dupin and Roderick at his childhood home. He wonders if it would ever have been enough for him. Does he take any responsibility for the people he's affected by his company's decisions. Questions if Roderick even cares what's become of his company's biggest opioid which is Letadone as this is what makes the company the most profit and is what they're known for but in the wrong hands it can be addictive and lethal and this is the driving force for Lupin to ending their company. During this discussion, we see Roderick sees a burnt person in the corner of the room, who we later discover is the result of what happened to Perry in this episode, which Roderick blames himself for his son's death. He asks Dupin, who was that informant, as he was told by his oldest son Frederick that it was Perry, who Roderick describes as the crazy one, but also the first of his children to die. As we see Perry waking up to a bed filled with people, which is definitely foreshadowing to what's going to happen later, he's still so confused and upset that his father didn't go with his club idea, which was his nest egg investment. 
This was the investment that Roderick gave all of his children, but he had to be convinced that this would be worth the money and the time to invest into their idea. This is where we get a taste of the denial game that the ushers played when questioned by authorities about their business. As we see firsthand the lack of accountability they take in their wrongdoings, as we see Pim, Perry, and Frederick in this scene denying everything that was questioned to them. As there's at least a dozen condemned unsafe buildings that the ushers aren't claiming as their own and that are in violation, now Perry was here in this meeting to only shadow his big brother, but he's making matters worse by not sticking to the script and showing interest in one of the buildings. As Fred pulls him outside to remind him to do as he's told and to stick to the script that they use whenever questioned by allegations against their company, this scene also shows us how much big brother doesn't like nor trust his little brother as he tells Perry that he knows that he's the rat. As I believe this was the moment that Perry set himself on this road of revenge to get back on his big brother for calling him the rat. As Perry doesn't listen to anything that was said to him, he decides to follow through with his pitch to his dad with that exclusive pop-up club and he's preparing to throw this huge party. Now this will be an orgy masquerade theme event. He's completely ignoring all the issues with this building and how unsafe it is. As Perry sees a woman in a coat looking directly at him at the top of this building, this is a woman he'll get the chance to meet later in his episode face to face. As Vic and Al continue to work on their trials with the monkeys, we see Roderick is putting the pressure on Al and Vic to speed up the process so they can do their human trials to hit the market in less than six months. Roderick tells Vic that he has 200 million invested in these trials and he needs this to work. Now to me, this scene definitely highlights that there's a level of desperation going on with Roderick. You can look at the look on his face. He seems to be very desperate. Does he have money issues that he's not telling the family about? Or as I'll discuss later, I I believe he has health issues and he wants this trial to be speeded up so he can prevent himself from dying. As is being established that the illegitimate children seem to be closer with one another and they're also targeted by the others as we have a scene being played out by Napoleon helping his younger brother finding dealers to sell at his party. Meanwhile, Camille has her assistants continue to look for the rat as she wants that bounty money, but there is clearly some issue, some beef, some history between her and Vic. As we hear about the golden rule, back with Roderick and Dupin, we see the same dead burnt person, which we know to be Perry, but this time he's looking them directly in his face. As he's describing his joke he found in the comic, and he goes into this drug called Castle. Now, this is a preventative treatment for dementia, which to me, it goes back to, is Roderick saying without saying that he was rushing those trials for Vic because he's trying to prevent himself from getting sick? Is Roderick dying? Would that explain why he passed out back in episode one? As the conversation goes into us meeting Rufus Griswold, who was named after a real life editor and poet, Letterdone is what Roderick brought to Griswold before he eventually took over as CEO. See him pitching this pill to him as this is a pain remover, as Roderick calls it a pill to make the world without pain. Now during this pitch, you'll notice that Roderick seemed to be very thoughtful, seemed to be very caring. He really wants to seem to help people, at least that's what the pitch showed, as it was very convincing, but at least for now, the pitch doesn't work. Now I believe this meeting took place not too long before him and his sister met Raverna, and I believe they did something to Rufus, and whatever the deal is they made with her on the night of the New Year's Eve, I believe that that is the official night that they became the CEOs and the COO of the company. As we meet his first wife, Annabelle, and their two oldest kids, to me, Annabelle seemed to be a saint. Like, she seemed to really ground both Roderick and his sister in their very stressful fields of businesses, and I just wonder what happened to her. As Madeline is focused on her work in tech and believes that tech can change the world, I thought the conversation they were having at the table about algorithms taking over the world was very timely to us in today's society, as we see a scene with older Madeline, who's working on creating an AI for Lenore, which I think is an important sign plot that we should keep an eye out for for future episodes. Now speaking of young Lenore, she learns the funny story of how her grandfather and his new super young wife Juno met. While the scene kind of plays more on the comedic side, it is important to point out that Juno was on this never used before new dosage of Letadone, which to me makes me wonder if Roderick is only married to her to observe this new dosage and to study the progress or to see if there's any major side effects. That's a Freddy attempting to invite Morelli, which we know as Fred's wife to his party to try to awaken her more free-spirited and sexual side and to have no judgments from people like her more reserved husband Fred. 
For the note, Morella is a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, and it follows a woman who's studying German philosophers as she's dealing with the question of identity, which to me lines up perfectly with this characterization of her in this episode as she's seeking to discover her identity in this and by the end deciding to attend this party to see if that side of her still exists. We see more of this dysfunctional family sexual hobbies as we see Tamerlane gets off by hiring a woman to act out scenes with her husband who's the fitness trainer to eventually have sex with cut to seeing Camille and her relationship with her assistants doing both business and pleasure as sleeping with them seems to be a routine. We end this episode as Morelli arrives to Perry's sex party. We learn that Perry's real reason for inviting her wasn't to help her sexual awakening, but he wanted to record her cheating on Frederick and using this as some form of maybe future blackmail or a way to get over on him if he ever needed to because these brothers truly hate each other. As the woman from earlier in the episode standing on top of the building has arrived, dressed in all red and wearing a skull mask, it's revealed to be Verna. She her lure Perry into one of the sex rooms, initially tried to stop him and warns him about the consequences of him hosting this party. There was still time for Perry to stop what was about to happen, but his cravings of sex and drugs and debauchery wins and he ignores this warning. As we see Verna possesses the security guards and others to leave and she tries to do the same for Morelli as I believe she chose those particular people because they weren't partaking in the actual situation or maybe they had pure souls. As the security guards and some of the other people she warned leaves but unfortunately we see that she stays. Assume that her true intentions overpowered Verna's possession or her warning. Now we don't actually see her actual body in this sea of death but it's assumed that she died. Which speaking of death, we see Perry signals to turn on the water to fulfill his fantasy. Now this was supposed to be water coming from these sprinklers, but instead, now trapped and locked inside, the chemical hits their skin and burns them all and melts everyone in attendance on the floor. This was easily one of the most brutal scenes that we've seen so far in this show as they're all stuck together as I mentioned very similar to when we first met Perry waking up to that body of people in his bed. It looks like they're clay together. This was incredibly disturbing especially the sound design and effects were just perfect in this scene. As Verna kisses the once beautiful boy in my eyes this was the kiss of death. Wow, what an ending with that overshot of the dead bodies with their skin all melted off. Now getting back to the significance of the title of this episode, the title being The Mask of the Red Death. Now this was a short story by Edgar Allan Poe and the story followed a Prince Prospero who attempts to avoid the dangerous plague known as the Red Death by hiding inside his abbey. Now him along with many other wealthy nobles host a masquerade ball in seven rooms of the abbey, each designed with a different color. Now in the midst of their festivities, a mysterious figure disguised as a red death victim enters and makes his way through each room. At the end of the story, Prospero dies after confronting this stranger who costume proves to contain nothing tangible inside and the guest died as well, which is obviously a very important connection to what we saw at the end of this episode. In episode 3 of The Fall of the House of Usher, which was titled Murder in the Rue Morgue, which was described as the first modern detective story by Edgar Allan Poe, as Camille plays detective in this episode to find what her sister Vic was up to when it came to her experiments with those monkeys and well, she found out. As Camille was responsible for her family's publicity in this episode, she conspired to spin the controversy in her family's favor, all while exposing the grim details of her sister's experiments. We open the episode with Pym on the scene of Perry's death party, and with the Usher's family connections, he was able to gain access to explore the murder scene without being accompanied by police. As we find out why they call him the Brim Reaper, he walks across all the dead bodies like it's just a regular day. As he comes across Perry's bodies and takes his phone, and notices the cameras in the building, but also he comes across a survivor. As we learned that the tanks connected to the sprinklers were indeed hazardous material, that they were hiding to avoid EPA fines, but also charges that came with that, but Perry unfortunately didn't pay attention and also hired a nobody that didn't test it out first. Horrible accident, but the one thing that still doesn't add up, what happened to the waiting staff? Why did they leave before it all went down? Now we know as an audience that it was Verna and the possession she had over the people, but Roderick, Madeline, and Pym are under the impression that this was all a setup. Now the story goes for now that the cover up will be that they're going to blame someone else at the party and not Perry. Meanwhile, Pym's going to look into that camera footage. As we learn that the survivor is indeed Morella, as Pym is tasked with giving him the script on if anyone asks you, this is what happened. 
As the rest of the kids learn of the tragic news, we see Roderick doesn't want his daughter, who normally handles the PR messes, he doesn't want her anywhere around this story. But she comes up with the genius idea to have the public give them the sympathy angle as she's going with the whole tagline of America's Fallen Prince. This is yet another nod to the episode before, which was The Mass of the Red Death, which that story by Edgar Allan Poe focused on the prince, Prospero. The angle is something they can use during this time of their trial, and the grieving process is a way to keep the media attention from them. This scene was the perfect illustration of the key focus of this episode being Camille and seeing her skills on full display. This is exactly how this family has been able to keep their billion dollar company going for all these years as we see it playing out on the news with Dupin reminding people that ushers are still on trial but a reporter spends his word to make it seem that Perry's death was justice for their crimes. As Fox News makes Camille happy, she still has her eyes on the prize for that bounty as her assistants tell her that there is definitely definitely something going on with her sister, more involving this issue with missing animal livestock, and the rumor is that Vic is swapping out the animals and falsely reporting the numbers, doing some dirty work off the clock. Now this was a quick scene, but an important one nonetheless, as Camille assistants tell her that they're sorry for her loss, and if you look at the look on her face here, it says it all. Some of these family members don't care if they lose someone close to them, they almost don't have this humane side to them, and this moment doesn't shake Camille at all. Cut to this moment where we see Vic who's now back in the office, but we see her having this moment to herself where it actually shows that she's affected by losing her little brother. But man, it doesn't last long as she walks out of the office and she bumps into Verna. Now Vic shows some level of compassion and promises Verna, who's acting as this person named Pam who's having a heart condition, she tells her that she's going to make sure that her paperwork is seen by all the main doctors. Just when you think that an Usher member actually cares and she's going to take care of this paperwork, it is not the case as she immediately takes pictures of this person's medical records and she sees her as a perfect candidate for her human trials. Cut to this brother sister Bonnie moment as Napoleon gets prepped by Camille while on drugs. Now we get some interesting backstory on both characters as Leo met his father when he was 18, Perry met him when he was 16, and Camille met their father at the age of 20. Learn that Leo is actually the only usher that's not tied into the direct family business as he actually is a video game developer or if you ask Camille, he pays people to make video games for him because the ushers don't make anything. Cut back to the conversation between Roderick and Dupin. When life throws lemons at you, you don't just make lemonade, you make a multi-billion lemonade company and patent it. That's the Usher way. This was easily one of my favorite moments of this show so far as we get the classic Mike Flanagan monologue and this is one of many that we have in this incredible episode. Ben tells Roderick that Perry actually had a knockoff brand of letadone in his system when he died called Monty. As Roderick wasn't aware of this finding, we get this really effective jump scare where Camille is behind him grabbing his shoulders and it doesn't stop there because we get the first for me legit jump scare that actually got me which is when Roderick gets a refill and she pops up in his face the most effective jump scare so far in this show. We learned that Letterdome was given to Roderick. Remember, the ushers don't make things. As he was just the middleman, it wasn't his. As we cut to middle-aged Roderick busting into Rufus's office because Rufus took his patent idea from him. He did get $500 out of this, but as Rufus puts it, he should use this moment and learn from this and maybe, just maybe, he'll be next door to him. So we see not only got the $500, he also got a 15% raise and he now moved up to the fourth floor. All this good news doesn't impress his sister Madeline, who reminds him of their days when they were orphans, as Madeline tells him how to play the long game, not charging right at your target, but instead stand next to them, learn from them, and then eventually stab them in the back. As we do eventually find out that Pim discovers that Verna was the only one unaccounted for at Perry's party, as I believe this is their first entry point to figuring out who's killing all his kids. Cut to Leo waking up from his night of grieving with all those drugs. He has scratches all over his face and he's covered in someone else's blood as he thinks that he might have killed his boyfriend, but no, he actually killed his boyfriend's cat and brutally murdering him by stabbing him to death. Just like any Usher family member would do, he gets rid of everything before his boyfriend wakes up as Leo makes it seem that the cat accidentally was let out. Back at the hospital, we get a quick scene of Lenore witnessing her mother ripping off all her bandages one would assume that she's never going to be the same again. Setting it up with Vic calling Verna aka Pam about her paperwork as she invites her into a very exciting new trial to help her with her heart condition. Just as this is happening, Tamron Lane's sex toy fantasy woman doesn't arrive but instead Verna playing another role as Candy is covering for her. 
My goodness, she gives them an award-winning performance, and she gets a little bit personal as she mentions Perry, and almost performs like she's actually Bill's wife, and Tam, she's loving every second of this. As we see Camille arrive at a secure location, and she isn't let in by this new security guard, who yet again is played by Verna. Just like she did with Perry, she tries to warn her that she can go about doing this another way, but Camille doesn't listen. As Camille starts to take photos of all these poorly treated monkeys, we see one of the cages opens up. Verna walks in, the first thing she asks is, why does she hate Vic so much as she goes into the long documented cruel history of experiments on animals? Now Camille at this point is pissed off and she threatens to kill the security guard until Verna jumps on the table like a wild animal and begins to start to move like one as well. Verna slowly opens her shirt, we see that she has the marks on her chest and she begins yelling and is at this point that you realize that she's actually swapped bodies with the monkey. Verna, as his monkey, tells Camille that she was supposed to go out in a more peaceful and quieter manner in her bed, but she didn't listen. And hey, it's not personal, as Camille just says, screw it, she ultimately takes the picture of this monkey, but unfortunately, she gets her face beat in to death by this monkey. As we cut to the next morning and the employees walk in to find Camille's face and body has been mauled by this Caesar from Planet of the Apes, what an incredible ending. Now to make the connection to the title of this episode to Edgar Allan Poe's work, besides the detective angle, this short story, interestingly enough, was the first appearance by the character Dupin. As many saw this as the first big detective before Sherlock Holmes was even famous, as his story followed him in Paris as he attempts to solve the mystery of the brutal murder of two women, which connects to the Camille character trying to find out what her sister was up to with the experiments of these monkeys. In episode 4 The Fall of the House of Usher, which was titled The Black Cat, which is based on a dark story about a man who tortured and later killed his own cat, a decision that will haunt him forever. As Leo adopts a black cat who soon brings evil and a mysterious woman into his home, while Roderick struggles with terrifying hallucinations. As we open the episode with Leo on the hunt for a replacement of his boyfriend's cat, and after his fifth stop, he arrives to a location and finds Verna, who's there to help. As she shows him every cat that doesn't fit the description of the cat that he's looking for, he comes across a black cat that looks exactly like the one that was killed, but unfortunately, it's not available. But we know, no or not available are words that don't fit in the Usher's vocabulary. So Leo decides to offer to buy every cat and to give away and to provide upgrades to the facility. And this actually works as she gives him the cat, but it is important to note that he took a picture of her holding that cat and I believe this photo is something that Roderick or Madeline will find and they'll start to realize that this is the same woman that happens to be the last person their kids see before they die. As Leo takes the cat home and immediately things start off bad as the cat cuts him and runs off just as he gets the news that his sister just recently died. The top at hand is denial. This is a conversation that Roderick and Dupin have about how well it works for members of his family, including himself. In this scene, there are two things that stood out to me. Number one, Roderick is constantly getting these messages on his phone. He claims that it's his granddaughter, Lenore, which if you look closely enough, you can see that it is her name that pops up on his phone. But the question is, is that really her? Is she in danger? Why isn't he answering her phone calls? And then the number two thing that stood out to me in this scene, something makes a noise in the basement and Roderick claims that it's Madeline, but the question is, is that really her? And if it is her, did he end up finding out that she's the informant and he tied her up, or maybe even worse, maybe he killed his own sister? I'm very excited to see how this particular scene plays out. As a family meeting is called, but this time around has three less Usher members in attendance, as Leo is shocked and blames Vic, Vic blames their dad for the bounty that he created, all while Fred has a wife in the ICU, and Tam, she's only concerned about her product launch. As we can see, priorities and emotions are all over the place with this family. As Roderick tells all the kids in the room to toe the line, time to build a wall, and to do what's told of them, no questions asked. A line we'll hear a little bit later in this very episode, as Leo has has had enough and he won't speak on the family's behalf to the media as he was told and even threatens his dad to remove him from the will and he walks away. Meanwhile, Pim shows footage of the security guard that Camille spoke to before she died. Even though they couldn't make out who this was, they are starting to believe that this is the same person that might have been involved in Perry's death. As Leo is having a meltdown of what to wear for two funerals, his boyfriend is yet to see this new cat, but suddenly it pops out at Leo, but his boyfriend just missed it. Now, it was at this point that I started to realize, oh, maybe this cat isn't alive, maybe it's actually the same cat that died and it's like an evil spirit, it's like a mad, crazy trick that Vera's playing on him. 
him where Leo can only see the cat and no one else. Now, even though the Usher family has some deaths that just recently took place, they still have a trial to attend. As Pim is late, but he informs the judge that his lateness was due to the recent death of Camille as they delay this trial a few more days. As Roderick talks to Vic in private to see, one, if she's the informant, but two, what was Camille doing looking around in her lab? As he hints that he might be calling it quits with this project, Vic tells him that they're ready to do human trials, which pulls him back into the fold. And yet again, he mentions how important her work is to getting things figured out. As my predictions that I talked about in my previous videos are proven to be true in this episode a little bit later. As Pim eventually gets a better version of the video of who the security guard was and sends it to Madeline and Roderick, and you can tell the look on their face shows they recognize who this person was, as Madeline takes a detour to what appears to be the same bar her and Roderick first met Vera at, as it's now been shut down, but there's a raven present there looking to directly at her. I'm very curious to know why Madeline went to the bar if this is indeed that same bar that they met Vera with back in 1980, but I'm starting to think also that maybe Vera had some type of deal with Madeline that Roderick wasn't aware of. So we get a quick scene of Roderick looking at that same stone wall that we saw back in the quick flashes of episode one as he starts to hear his jingles behind the wall, which might point at that gesture that he saw at the end of episode one. As trust is the topic at hand in this following scene, we see Pam signing her life away and putting all her trust in Vic's hands and in this future-proof world without pain heart device as her surgery is set for later in the week, which to me perfectly lines up to when we can expect to see Vic scheduled to die. As Leo can't sleep and he has Jules help him out with this, he notices the pet cemetery cat staring at him from the distance as he discovers the first dead animal under his pillow, one of many he'll find throughout this episode. Displacement. This is yet another topic covered in the conversation between Dupin and Roderick as they talk about this being another mechanism used by the Usher family. Now, Roderick talks about how him and Leo shared a lot in common when it came to how they handled their emotions, and out of nowhere, Leo's body falls from the ceiling onto the floor, obviously freaking out Roderick, but also freaking me out and Dupin at the same time as they go into the first day they met and how Roderick saw the world differently after this day. Cut to that day where Dupin was looking into his boss Rufus and some fraud going on as Annabelle invites him in he shows Roderick all of his signatures all over these believed to be forged paperwork to consent for his patients. Annabelle is certain and frankly quite knows that those weren't her husband's signatures but Rod is surprised but he doesn't show his cards because he doesn't want to compromise his position at work as it appears he's taken advice from his sister on playing the long game and striking when it's the proper time to do so. Now this might have been stepping over the line but I love the monologue given by Dupin when Rod pretends to not know how his signatures ended up on those pages and basically gives him this important message about doing the right thing. Now, I can understand now why Rod would consider this to be a very important day to him because in all truth and honesty, he should have quit that job as soon as he saw these forged signatures. Cut to the scene where Rod confronts his boss about these signatures and it's pretty much implied and confirmed that those were fake signatures as Rufus switches the tone in the room and questions if Rod is a part of the team and he recites the same exact speech that we saw earlier in this episode when Roderick was given to his children about stepping up and being on one side and being one unit. It is clear as day now that Roderick shaped his whole business persona from his boss. Rod is just ignoring all the signs to leave this company as Rufus says that he's the Willy Wonka of the situation and that he will give Rod a golden ticket if he sticks around. Now for a brief second here we see Annabelle and Matt Madeline seemed to be on the same page of how Roger handled the situation as Annabelle suggests that he quits his job, but he puts it, well, if I quit, I'm going to probably be blacklisted from any other positions because of how powerful his boss is. But then this is where Madeline steps in and she suggests that her brother acknowledges the situation, remember the situation, but continue to play the game, but then call Dupin as soon as possible, become best friends with Dupin and play nice with him. Eventually, he's going to catch Rufus red-handed in the act and that will be the opportunity for Rod to claim their birthright for their father's company.
I love the back and forth and the duality between kind of that good angel, bad angel when we see these scenes between Roderick's wife and his sister who seems to be more on the sinister and more kind of take the bad root side and not only did these two scenes show me that Rod did take a lot from his boss as far as his persona and how he treats his company, how he treats his employees, but he also learned a lot from his sister Madeline. Now we see Fred pays his brother a visit because he needs drugs for everything going on with his wife, but also in this episode, Pim gives him the burner phone that Perry gave her, which causes him to start to think that maybe she was involved in some things that he wasn't aware of. But yet again, this pet cemetery crazy sadistic cat comes out of nowhere and scratches him, but this time it scratches him in the eye, and yet again, it appears that Fred doesn't see the cat, and the only one that sees him is Leo, as Fred takes a coke and hopes that it's going to help him out. As the show was setting up Tam's inevitable demise, she watches her husband husband on TV during his show and she notices that Candy is there. Now I love how the show has been putting Verna in front of them the whole time but no one has yet to kind of put the pieces of the puzzle together. As Tam confronts her husband about this later in the episode, meanwhile Leo continues to find dead animals all over his apartment which leads him to call him Verna for help. As the cat is now on the walls, Verna talks about how cats are predators and how effective they are as hunters as the cat attacks him and they have this bit of a scuffle which leads to the cat getting his eye ripped out as as we see Verna's eye is now missing and like she did with the monkey she's now taking the form of this cat and Leo is now the prey. As he grabs his Thor hammer sent from Thor himself as he starts to break down the walls he grabs a hold of the cat and it's a full out battle. Meanwhile we see Fred is taking those drugs and decides to remove a piece of equipment from his wife's fingers in hopes that it's going to unlock the phone but has no luck in doing so so he decides to take it a step further and takes off her bandages instead and it still doesn't work with her face unlocking because hey she doesn't have a face. I'm very curious to see where this plot lands and what is he going to find the phone? Is it going to be photos of her maybe kissing someone or maybe thinking that Perry and her had an affair? Very intrigued to see where this storyline goes. Now, like I mentioned in my previous video, we have this scene here where Juno is wanting to take a break from the drug linodone, but Roderick tells her that no, you don't need to do this because she's his perfect proof that it works. Again, where I'm at right now is I think that he's not with her because he loves her. I mean, he might like her, but I don't think he loves her, but I think he married her for he can keep eyes on her, keep tabs on her, study her progress with his drugs to see if there is a side effect, but also, as we'll later learn in this episode, he probably wants to use the drug for he can use for himself because as we find out later, he's dying. But the important thing to also point out in this scene is he gets his first vision of his dead son Perry right behind her as he is shocked and it scares the hell out of him. As this leads to Madeline arriving and it is confirmed in this very scene as I talked about in my previous videos that Rod is indeed sick. He actually suffers from the same sickness that his mother had but at this point is pretty advanced. As is also said in this scene that all the different various projects from the Linodone to Vic's project had all been for him to actually use and this is the first time as adults for me that we get to see these two characters being vulnerable in the scene. Now we end the episode with Jules finally arriving home and seeing most of the walls have been torn down in the apartment and the apartment is basically destroyed as is Leo Sanity as he finally sees well the cat never existed as it appears out of nowhere on the balcony edge as Leo runs towards it he falls off the balcony and lands face first on the concrete and he's dead. Now we know in the next episode next in line to die is Vic. Now this episode The Black Cat was based on an Edgar Allan Poe story and it basically followed the story of an unnamed character who had a strong affection for pets but eventually it turned to him abusing them. As his favorite black cat bites him one night and the narrator decides to punish the cat by pulling one of his eyes out and eventually hanging it on a tree. Now this led to his house inevitably burning down but on one of the walls there was this burned outline of that same cat hanging from a noose. Now later the character replaces the cat with another cat that looked very similar to his but soon he develops a hatred for this cat. Now long story short, this particular character end up getting the new cat, tried to kill his cat, but end up killing his wife instead. He end up finding the cat and also his wife behind a wall with led to the police arrest of him. So you can see that there are some nods and some similarities in this episode as has the other episodes have been. But the thing that kind of was off with me in this episode was the central theme of the character being compared to Leo didn't work for me. In episode 5 of the fall of the house of Usher, which was titled The Telltale Hearts, which 
which is based on a story about chasing perfection and greed as Vic inches closer to testing her heart technology on a patient until tensions erupt between her and Al. Meanwhile, Depin makes a chilling confession. We open this episode back on New Year's Eve night when Roderick and Madeline met Verna as Roderick tells Verna how his mother felt that ravens were considered to be the minions of Satan because Noah threw them off the ark but they still managed to survive the flood. As Verna mentions how ravens are sometimes considered good fortune, as she reads his palm and tells him that his life is going to change on that night. As it's now Roderick's turn to be seen on the dance floor dancing with the stranger as part of their alibi, it hit me at this scene here that Annabelle must have been out of the picture at this exact point because one, he's not wearing his ready ring, but two, we see him later kissing a stranger who I'm led to believe might be Leo's mom. Verna talks to Madeline about her resolution for New Year's Eve and how she's being the one that keeps Roderick in check and helping him out. She mentions that she's a queen without a crown. As the countdown nears zero, Verna asks if she'll rather be rich or famous. As we see, Madeline replies she would rather be rich, but what does she do now? Well, she says that she would never want a man to ever have power over her and that she'll figure out a way to live forever as Verna kisses her essentially kind of making her wishes come true. As it appears that we're getting closer to finding out what happened that night on New Year's Eve, but more importantly, what happened to Annabelle? As we cut to the funeral of Perry, Camille, and Leo, as we see the mothers are present and they clearly seem to be, at least in my eyes, to be more saddened by the deaths of their kids more so than the ushers, as Roderick sees the burnt version of Perry, but he also now sees the gesture in the balcony looking down at him. The funeral is now coming to a close and we see Roderick looking at the mothers of his dead children and he has nothing to say to them as he walks away he turns around and sees all three of his dead kids now staring at him as the three remaining kids now have 24 hour security following them around no matter where they go we get a little bit more insight of how the three remaining kids felt about the other kids as they talk about Annabelle being the only true love of Roderick versus his other relationships even including his new one with Juno now the conversation doesn't end with them bonding over their dead siblings, but instead it ends with Vic saying that she's going to end up on top. I personally wish we would have seen more of these moments with the kids together, and I'm not saying like in the sense of like a hunting on Hill House type of cast and getting all that backstory, but I wish we could have gotten maybe a handful of more scenes of seeing them whether they were younger or at this age, because this scene just shows their chemistry was just so damn good. Now back home with Vic and Al, Al is clearly upset to find out that she's been booked for surgery, but even more upset after she learns that Vic actually forged her signatures to get everything to pass. At this point, Al is completely out of not only the business with her girlfriend, but now out of this relationship. As we see Vic trying to attempt to cry and show some type of emotion to get her to stay, that doesn't work, so now she brings in the NDA, but Al doesn't care what she does to her as she officially wants to be out of this family, and she also calls the family monsters. We see Vic get upset and throw something at the door. We see that her world is starting to fall apart. Meanwhile, back at Vic's office where she's leaving tons of voicemails for Al that she's not answering and we find out why a little bit later, she begins to hear this noise that she can't seem to find where it's coming from as Madeline pays her a visit to check in on the status of her human trials. Now, we know that she's there because of obviously discovering what's going on with her brother and her health, but this is another example of Madeline now putting the pressure on Vic, which later has her crack. Cut to seeing Dupin and Pim with the judge addressing how to move forward after the recent family tragedies as Pim or most likely Malin came up with a really good idea which was saying that since Dupin said that there was an informant involved this probably sparked some type of attack on the family which again was a really good idea again if that was Pim or Madeline or both of them as Pim puts it on the table should we just delay this trial which seems to be something that the judge is on board with or will Dupin give up who the actual informant is? Before all this took place in the scene, there was a moment at the very beginning when we saw Dupin talking to Pim about him being a good and a smart man. Why is he working for the Usher family? And Pim responds by saying that he got everything in his life all due to Roderick. I'm very interested and also excited to get more of Mark Hamill number one, but I'm very curious about how Pim got all wrapped up into this family. 
Cut back to one of my favorite scenes of the show, which is the conversation between Roderick and Dupin. As we see Rod ask him, who is the informant? At this point, it doesn't matter. All of his kids are gone. He can tell him the truth, and Dupin gives him a confession. And that is that there was never an informant. As we see, Dupin went against his principles, and he got this move straight out of the Usher handbook. I personally love these scenes between Dupin and Roderick because, number one, the acting is on point. The dialogue is fantastic, but also, we get some of the best jump scares as out of nowhere we see blood starts coming from Dupin's shirt and his heart starts pounding out of his chest as Vic appears and starts screaming. Roderick tells Dupin that he can relieve himself of the guilt of being responsible for killing his children for faking the whole informant thing but again going back to these two I love their scenes I love the dialogue some of the best jump scares come from their scenes I am so excited to see how their scene's gonna end. As we cut back to a flashback scene in a meeting that took place between Madeline and Rufus as she's trying to add more computers to his arsenal, but this isn't Roderick that he's dealing with as we see Madeline pushes back to him when he tries to make a move with her, but then he actually takes the next step and gets aggressive and starts badmouthing her as he brings up that he knew who their actual father was, but then he goes a step further and goes really low when he mentions their mom and what her relationship was with their dad. Then he goes on to bring up that she she can have sex with him and that's her way of climbing a ladder but to never screw him over my goodness I love this version of Madeline I love the performance by Willa and that guy that plays the boss he is a creep he is the worst he is despicable but the actor he's doing a phenomenal job of being a creep find out that this was all set up and this was a part of the collaboration they're doing with working with Dupin I gotta say I love this plot this might be my favorite plot of the show seeing the younger versions of these characters and how their careers shook out it's just so interesting the story is so compelling the acting has been amazing and like i said this is the best element in the best plot of the show for me personally as Pim shows Madeline and Roderick all the pictures he's gathered of Verna, and this is where we see Madeline remembers and tells her brother she knows exactly where she remembers her face from, and that's back in 1980 at that New Year's Eve party. We learn that bringing up what happened on that night is forbidden to be spoken of, especially in front of anyone, and we know that Pim is present in this scene, as Rod refuses to believe this is the same bartender from 40 years ago and has an age one day, but then Madeline brings up, well, maybe it's not her but maybe you end up sleeping with that bartender and she's the result of that and that is a crazy daughter seeking revenge as they send their guard dog Pim to have full authority to do whatever it takes to find her and he gets the authority to actually kill her and Madeline adds another little bonus to it which is get me her eyes as a trophy will the reaper meet his match and that is death as Vic meets with Pam and things seem to be normal but not in Vic's head as she continues to hear that noise and the question about her humanity is put to the table as we can clearly see she's losing it. As we have a conversation about passing the Usher family traditions along from generation to generation, we get a very important scene here between Fred and Vince's daughter, Lenore, as he tells her about the future threats she'll encounter when she gets older just because of her last name and how she should handle that, and also to keep things in perspective and keep her family protected and doing whatever is told of her later down the road. Now, while one relationship is broken down in this episode between Vic and Al, we're starting to see the cracks of this relationship break between Tam and her husband as she tells him that he was carefully selected he was handpicked to be her husband she made this call to build her brand, to build her company. He's replaceable. Now, I didn't expect it to get to these heights, but it's starting to make sense. As Tam is under the impression that he's been sleeping around, hanging out with Candy, they've been going on walks and whatnot, he tells her that's been her the whole time, so she's starting to lose her mind. Her insecurities are starting to get the best of her because their whole sexual lifestyle choices that she made is not the best thing for this relationship, as he tells her that he hated doing all that and he ultimately leaves this setup between tam and will and that relationship and also this this scene here and this performance was fantastic i am very interested to see how they're going to kill off that character as we see Roderick talking to that same stone wall that we saw all the way back in episode one as Roderick believe he knows how to stop all of this See him preparing to take his own life. Will he do it by overdosing on his own pills? Will he stab himself in the stomach? Will he jump out of the window? Well, he doesn't do any of that. He doesn't have the courage to do so, which leads him to heading to his daughter house and talking to Vic. 
as we end this episode by him apologizing for having the kids turn against one another, he tells her that he's not strong, he's not brave, and he will fully support her with everything she needs to complete this project. Conversation pivots when we see her talking to her dad and asking if he can hear that noise, which he confirms he does. As we see in the background, Al returns, but then we cut back to that night and when they got into that fight, and we see what actually happened that night. First saw the scene, we saw that Vic threw something at the door, but they didn't finish the scene. Well, we see that she threw that object at her girlfriend, and as we see the title being playing out, she blames this out of number one, her anger, but also because she felt as though that Al was going to tell on her, hence the telltale hearts. She kills her girlfriend, and she doesn't even consider calling 911. As we finally get the reveal of what that actual noise was, we see what Vic did with her body as she cut her chest open and she put that device on her heart and that's where the noise was coming from, she blocked it out. Vic has completely lost her mind. This shows that he has broken his kids, but also that their mental state is unstable. This shows that some of these kids, and Vic being one of them, has not only lost their heart, but they also lost what it means to be a human. As we see Vic pull a knife on her dad, but ultimately she claims that they need a better heart, she stabs herself and she dies. So we now know that Tam is next in line to die, but let's talk about the significance of this title, which was based on The Telltale Heart, which is a short story by Edgar Allan Poe, which followed an unnamed narrator who endeavors to convince the reader of the narrator's sanity while simultaneously describing a murder that the narrator committed. The victim was an old man with a filmy pale blue eye or as it's called the vulture eye as the narrator says. The narrator emphasizes the careful calculation of the murder, attempting the perfect crime, complete with dismantling the body in a bathtub and holding it under the floorboards. Ultimately, the narrator's actions will result in them hearing a thumping sound, which the narrator interprets as the dead man's beating heart. In episode 6 of The Fall of the House of Usher, which was titled Gold Bug, a story based on flaws and imperfections, as we see several of these characters slowly but surely falling down the rabbit hole of madness. As Pym digs up disturbing information on Verna, we see Tam and her marriage on a decline as she hosts a product lunch that shatters expectations. As we open the episode with Tam, who's clearly sleep deprived, which is causing her to experience these blackouts and doing things she's not aware of or it appears that maybe someone or something doing things for her instead as she prepares for her big presentation. She notices someone walking by her room which leads her to finding this green box with a green bug emblem on it. She opens up the box to finding dead bugs inside. Now this leads her to trying to sleep but with so much on her mind sleeping is becoming impossible to do at this point. Now Dupin still isn't a believer of Roderick's claims of knowing all the details of his children's death as we cut to the scene of seeing Rod covered in blood showing off the sapphires said to give you sight in the afterlife. Details all the information on how he managed to get these all for his sister's birthday as it is revealed that he's speaking to his dead children. As Madeline arrives to her brother's office to find that he actually removed the device from Al's heart himself, as she tells him that the company is in danger because Vic was on the board and he's starting to realize they're losing the numbers and they can potentially lose their company. As the number one priority right now for them is to find Verna, but Rod is more concerned about taking back the control of the board and making sure that they don't lose their company. As the news is released to the public about the death of Vic and Al, we see young Lenore is concerned about her own safety as her father reminds her that her aunts and uncles were weren't truly ushers as he tells his wife the news and mentions how you can never trust anyone. Definitely appears that they're setting up this plot that Fred might be the one that ended up taking his own wife's life based on his thoughts that she was having a secret life without him. We see Tam continue to lose her mind as it appears that Bill actually came home to check on her after learning about Vic's death as Tam tells him that she is driven to prove the world that the ushers are actually good but then she realizes that no one was there as she was talking or at the very least maybe Bill was was there but he left the keys and it officially says that their marriage is officially over and her truth was never heard by him. Now Tam isn't the only one in this episode that's losing her mind as we cut to a scene of seeing Rod who is definitely diving deeper into madness as young Lenore checks on him to see how he's doing he blames the hallucinations of seeing all his dead children to his sickness also with the lack of sleep but he promises his granddaughter that he's going to keep her safe. 
Meanwhile, Pim gathers all of Vic's belongings at the crime scene as the police just sit there and watch. He discovers some information that leads him to Pam's address, which he's headed off to. As we finally get a scene with Juno kind of detailing her loneliness, as Tam comes by the house to check on her dad, we see Juno tells her how she was hoping to find a sense of family when she married Roderick, but things never really changed. We see Tam for once finally kind of drops her dislike of Juno and kind of shows her a level of sympathy, even though she didn't hug her or say much to her, the fact that she didn't say anything mean or rude to me showed me that Tam has some type of relatability of this feeling of loneliness in this scene. As we see a scene with Madeline who's continuing to push the algorithm which will make people live forever we see that she gets a call from Pim who lets her know that he followed the address from Pam's file and it led him to Madeline and Roderick's child home which again fuels the idea that they believe that their family is under attack as we cut back to a conversation between Dupin and Roderick as we see Rod telling him just how important and special Pim has been to his family and just how far back he's been there for them as he describes Pim as a world traveler one that has seen many things his story were legendary but also very mysterious as he recalls a story of Pim telling his kids when they were younger about him finding this realm of beings who live between time and space. If you all remember this was the exact same line that Verna had told him and Madeline on the night of the New Year's Eve party so the question is is Verna one of those beings that lives between this realm of time and space? Now Dupin recalls this story of the 80s and bang the glass shatters behind Roderick and we see Tam's dead corpse walking towards him in this green dress now she reaches her hand out to help her father but then we see that Roderick realizes that it's actually Dupin giving him a hand to help him out now you all will notice the show has went along that not only have these jump scares become more like intense but Roderick seems to be getting closer to the dead which to me means that he's getting closer to death himself flashback to the scene involving the basement mission with the ushers and Dupin as he gives Roderick a list of things that he'll need to bring down Rufus now Roderick is willing to take this risk that will definitely end his career if he's caught something that makes his wife very proud of him as we see him in the basement making necessary copies of the paperwork they need to bring down Rufus so I'm just so curious to see how all this is going to shake up because like I mentioned in my last video this plot has been one of my favorites so far of this show now at this point Pim has gathered up as much information he can find on Verna which isn't a lot to begin with but he shows his information to Roderick and Madeline first off when it comes to this bar which number one wasn't a bar to begin with it's been vacant since 1975 but it doesn't stop there as he shows them all these pictures of Verna standing next to real life individuals such as Mark Zuckerberg and other very famous and wealthy individuals that dates back decades and I'm saying it goes all the way back to 1901. We cut to a scene with Lenore and her mother watching movies together and we get a really kind of interesting product placement of Netflix but even better we see Lenore ask her mother what's the next movie they should watch which is personal one of my favorites from Mike Flanagan as they highlight Gerald's game which obviously is a nice nod to Mike Flanagan to Netflix but also the two stars happen to be the stars of this show but more importantly we see her mother speaks for the first time and she tells her that she loves her which leads Lenore going down to her father of happiness and asking when will those specialists come for they can hopefully get their mother back but then we see that Fred really isn't that excited to get his wife back to good health and I believe that Lenore starting to realize that her father might do something bad to her mother which leads us into seeing this scene where we see Fred is continuing to use the drugs that Leo gave him but he's not the only one to use these drugs as we learn this scene that he's been giving his wife the same drugs now at this point we see that his wife is slowly getting back to talking so he asks her just how long has she been in a relationship with his now dead brother Perry which we know that he's been thinking that ever since he got that burner phone in his hands he's injecting the higher doses into her system which to me means he's slowly preparing to kill in his own wife so not only has he lost his mind his father's lost his mind and Tam so we're seeing the Usher family slowly killing themselves but the only one right now that seems to have their head on their heads properly is Lenore number one but also Madeline so right now they're the only two that I can see surviving this massacre which speaking of Madeline we cut to a scene where she's visiting her brother who's in the basement which we know this is the same basement that he went to to take down Rufus as she's trying to get him to get back into good spirits to put his head back on his shoulder to get back in the game because his daughter has the event going on which is one of 
the positive things going on with their company right now, but he can't seem to get his mind off of these bells that are ringing behind the wall. It leads Madeline to slapping him across the face and obviously saying one of the funniest lines so far this show as Rod just continues to claim that he doesn't know what's real, what's fake, but my question is, what is behind the wall? What is that gesture? Did they put Rufus behind the wall? I cannot wait to find out what is that reveal? What is behind the wall? What is that jingling noise? As it is time for Tam's presentation and Madeline tries to give her a pep talk telling her to break both of her legs. Now things start off pretty bad because soon as she gets on stage, she thinks that someone's speaking on her behalf, but she realizes it was just a presenter, but we know in her head she thinks she's seeing Candy walking around, but she's able to gather herself and just for a little bit, the presentation is going well, but unfortunately, she just completely drops the ball. At this point in the presentation, things had completely hit the wall as she thinks she sees Candy and the audience wearing the same green dress as she's wearing, so she is losing focus of the presentation, and she just inevitably just breaks. She thinks she sees Candy all over her presentation, all over the videos. Things just get worse from here as one of the video plays her sexcapades with her husband on screen. Now, she thinks in her mind that the audience sees this, but she's the only one that's seeing this, but it gets worse as she thinks she sees Candy walking towards her Tam grabs the microphone stand and throws it and accidentally hits Juno's head, which I'm not gonna lie, I feel so bad for Juno, but that scene was just so funny to me. Meanwhile, Madeline sees Verna in a crowd, which leads her to go into her. She reaches out to grab her, but unfortunately, there's nothing there, only black dust. As we end the episode with Tam, who's now at home, and she just knows that she's lost everything that she's built over the years, as Candy, who's just taunting her about Bill, as she breaks all the glasses around the house, the glasses bouncing in her face, Face. she's stepping on glass meanwhile candy is not letting loose she even says that at one point tam ate her twin baby in the wound and maybe this is the part of her brain that's taken over i mean she is really in tam's head as we watch candy just continue to torment her which leads to tam admitting that she messed up putting a focus on the word up as we see that she sees Candy above her on the glass mirror and she hits it which causes the glass from above and below her and it impales her in the front and the back killing Tam. Which means we only have one of the Usher kids left which is Fred. This was based on an Edgar Allan Poe story which the plot focused on a character by the name of William who became fixated on this unusual gold colored bug as he discovered it and it led to him going insane. Now a lot of this story included codes which were invented by Poe which was used for the first time in one of his stories. Now, one would say that code or hidden code in Tam's story connects to this bug, which if you look up bug and you look up a code, whenever you have a bug in your code, by definition, bug has many different definitions, but by one definition, a bug stands for imperfections. And we can tie that to Tam and her imperfections, her insecurities, her flaws in her relationship and her company's brand, which led to her losing her mind, which ultimately led to her death. In episode seven of The Fall of House of Usher, which was titled of the pit in the pendulum which is based on a very dark story about hope coming out of despair and having the will to survive but also seeing a cruel person dying in a slow and painful way as a furious Frederick sets out to handle unfinished business, Madeline receives an anonymous message at a old haunt. Meanwhile, Dupin grows weary of Roderick's motives. We open this episode with seeing a young Freddy who's looking at the clock on the wall, which is something I want you all to remember for later, as he's playing with his toys, which upsets his dad, who's with Dupin preparing for questions for his trial. As Annabelle has a brief moment with Dupin alone, as she wants him to give her his word, as he'll look out for Roderick, who will probably win or lose will lose his job and he makes his promise that he will take care of them after this is all said and done. The pen has always believed that there's no such thing as a good usher, but Roderick corrects him and says that he's wrong because Lenore is the best of all of them. She has all the best traits from her grandmother except for a broken heart, which we learn that it sounds like Annabelle has been gone for a long time. As Roderick is pissed to learn about everything that happened at the launch as well as the death of his daughter, as Madeline tries to explain what happened when she tried to grab Verna, but he doesn't want to believe any of this as this is pointing towards signs of some supernatural activity. As the board is prepared to make a vote and Fred is a very key vote and he can assure that they won't lose the company. As we witness this private meeting taking place between Pim and Madeline who believes that her brother isn't fit to remain the CEO of the company after discovering his recent health issues and she believes that this health issue is causing him to make bad decisions for the company. As she plans to take the company into the tech world and leave the pills behind, she wants to be the new CEO of this company, a decision that she claims 
games is the most difficult one she's ever had to make in her life. Meanwhile, we see Fred has put all the pictures of him and his wife's relationship on the wall for her to stare at as he continues to pump drugs into her system as he recalls the first day that they met and how it made him feel to meet someone like her, but fast forward to their current situation, he feels that everyone, including his wife, sees him as an unimportant person that can't make decisions and you shouldn't take him too seriously. Cut to Rod telling his son that he needs him and that the board is swinging and he's counting on him as Freddie claims that he's prepared to protect his family and this company and ensures that he can count on him. Juno sets up this meeting with Rod's private doctor about the recent dose of letadone. She wants to get off this so-called non-addictive drug and to my surprise, the doctor actually helps her by giving her the advice of how to get off of it, which is you have to do it very slowly, which is something we have a payoff for a little bit later in this episode. Meanwhile, back with Fred and his wife, he's making phone calls to get down Perry's crime scene building and he wants to get it torn down and he's calling these people and acting as if he is the current CEO of the company making himself feel big but then he tells his wife how his father taught him to get his home in order and get his home straight is to show authority. By being cruel, his way to do that is to taking out his wife's teeth. This is a level of cruelty which was so painful to watch but my goodness we have such a satisfying conclusion to how they killed this cruel man. Lenore confronts her dad about the specialist never showing up and his recent behavior, which leads to him snapping at her and leaving the house, which sets her on this path of going back to the importance of this episode's title, endurance, surviving, and also saving the ones you care most about. Cut back to the conversation between Dupin and Roderick. He is prepared to leave because he feels like Rod is dragging him along, like he's not getting anywhere, but this is where Rod tells him that he will get him on murder and more than once. Dupin isn't taking this bait, but suddenly the clock on the wall goes off and this is the first time that he sees what Roderick has been seeing this whole night which is messages from his dead children this particular one coming from Freddie. Rod explains that his actions during their conversation tonight has been micromanaged by his children because they want to make sure that he's giving all the right details all of a sudden all the buildup that we have been seeing this scene has been very disturbing have been having effective jump scares this might be the most effective one yet as Freddie appears with his mom but Freddie is now a younger child this is a very cruel trick as we see young Freddy's eyes roll to the back of his head that his body is being split in half. This scene was not only terrifying but I think it's the best one of the most effective scares till a little bit later in this episode but this scene was fantastic because it was just so brutal and also it is a great callback to what's happened a little bit later in this episode. As we flash back to Rod's big day on trial where his family is there to his surprise you'll see Madeline giving him a good look but also look at the look on on her face to me she gave him a look as almost like they have a plan in place which we're about to find out as we cut to the trial proceedings and to depends the prize roderick lies and says that the signed documents were indeed his signature but he also lies about meeting and being prepped for this exact trial he says that dupin has been harassing him and his family this whole time as a clearly upset dupin walks out of this trial you'll notice the smirk on madeline's face as rod is getting arrested as we're about to find out that this was all a part of her plan now, Madeline details to Annabelle the whole plan behind this. It was to get Roderick as to be the most important person of the company, which will lead to him coming up on top. As Madeline goes even further, throwing insults at Annabelle and her pureness and her kind-heartedness as she calls Madeline small and she leaves. We cut back to present day and we see Madeline removing her wig, which shows off that she is aging. She doesn't want to show her weakness as she heads into her childhood home to find Verna. She tells her that Rod has has been coming to the house recently and dropping off boxes in the basement and he's been coming there to cry as Madeline knows this was the same woman they met over 40 years ago. Madeline is here to renegotiate their deal but Verna refuses and Madeline seems to talk to her as though they're equals and she even manages to finally grab her and she snaps Verna's neck but she appears shortly after. As Madeline apologizes to her they continue to have their conversation and Madeline is told that she is one of Verna's favorites and she understands understands her methods. Cut to a scene of seeing Lenore break into her mother's room and sees what her father has done to her. Meanwhile, Juno comes to Rod's office and she wants to get off the drug as he tells her all the side effects that's going to come with it if she decides to quit and it'll take an agonizing three years to do so. 
As my theory I've been making for the past few videos have come true as we see Rod call himself Frankenstein and she's the monster in his perfect creation. He says that the drug was the water and she was the flower and his drug brought her back to life and he just married her to see her as the perfect project for himself. As Juno is willing to take three years of hell versus spending a lifetime with him, a great moment for a character who hasn't been on the screen a lot but I really enjoyed this moment for her. Back with Madeline and Vernon's discussion, a conversation about pain as Vernon Verna is the master of it, but she's also its witness. She's wanting to offer Madeline clarity with no strings attached as they speak of poetry and truth as she describes a location or a realm that she's found as she recites the popular poem by Edgar Allan Poe, The City in the Sea. A dark and gothic poem that describes a doomed city of sin that sinks to the bottom of the sea. The poem takes the reader through Death City. He rules this place from the throne and towers over it gigantically. The city is lit by nothing but the light from the sea, which I think is foreshadowing to what we might see in the finale. As Verna promises Madeline that she'll soon understand this moment of clarity. So we end this episode with seeing Lenore calling the police to help her mother. We see Freddy with construction workers ready to destroy this building. Now before they tear down the building, Freddy wants to go inside, which I believe he was hoping to find the missing wedding ring from his wife. He pees on the floor as a goodbye to his mother Harry, and all of a sudden, he passes out. His footsteps approach closer to him. It's revealed to be Verna. As we learn, she is interfering with his death by putting deadly nightshade into his drugs. And the reason she did this was after he cruelly pulled his wife's teeth out. Cut to a scene of her possessing him doing this as his wife watches her do so. Very similar to what she did at the club. Verna tells him he earned this and impersonates his voice to tear down the building. She tells him that Rod would have been a poet in another life and Freddie would have been a good dentist as he watches the wrecking ball move move outside just like the clock at the beginning of this episode but also just like the clock Dupin heard a very great callback. She sits next to him as everything slowly starts falling down. We have a pendulum that's swinging right above him. It's almost like a symbol of how he was trying to kill his wife very, very slowly. As Verna says to him that his death wasn't meant to be this cruel, but after what he did, this was meant to be. As it gets closer and closer, she tells him that yes, your dad was wrong, but that's no excuse as he slowly gets split in half. If you all remember, this was the vision that Roderick saw of his son when he was younger earlier in this episode. Episode, what a perfect callback and a perfect scene executed here. As we see Madeline telling her brother that Freddy has recently died and to remember the deal they made all those years ago and there's only one way out. He needs to be the hero as she hands her brother the drugs and this is the only way. As she pours the drugs in his hand, he takes the drugs while drinking it and as he's taking it, we see Madeline telling him he's a legend, he's a king, he's saving them all as he dies. We see Madeline hears a noise behind the wall but walks away as a mysterious hand comes to the frame and touches Roderick and wakes him up is no other than Verna who tells him that she won't let him get off that easy. Now the story this episode was based upon follows this main character who's experiencing being tortured. Said that this story is effective when it's inspiring fear into his readers because it heavily focuses on senses such as sound and emphasizing the reality unlike many of Edgar Allan Poe's stories which are mostly based into supernatural. The story focuses on what horror really is, not the physical pain of death but the terrible realization that a victim has no choice but to die. In episode 8 of The Fall of the House of Usher which was titled The Raven which is based on the classic story about a person's grief over losing their beloved. As we see what happened in 1980 as Roderick and his sister Madeline seize a chance to submit their fortune but for a price as decades later the remaining ushers reckon with the consequences. As we open this finale with the moment Vera brought Roderick back to life and goes over the stats and the high number of people that he and his drug have killed or have affected negatively as the drug was supposed to change the world for the better. She informs him that his sister tried to loophole her by telling him that taking his own life would end this deal, a sign of bad faith. As Roderick thinks that he can buy his way out of this by saying to her, what is her price? As there are just a few transactions left, as the opening bell has rung and she vanishes, but Rod Pass, that's been behind this stone wall, gives him one nice scare. Back with Lenora, Pim has arrived and tells her that her statements to the police will be torn apart and it's time for her to go with the statement that he's made for her. As Lenora doesn't care about her father's swinging vote or the company, she only is concerned about her mother. As she states the fact are that he tortured her mom, he was on drugs, 
and he got himself killed. As she looks the Pym Reaper in his eyes and tell him to stay as far away from her mother as possible as she makes another statement to the police. Meanwhile, Madeline walks into Fortunato to find her brother alive, but there's no time to have an awkward conversation about what happened and how he's alive as the board has elected to replace him with Madeline as the new CEO. As he's lost his children, now his company, but Dupin still doesn't believe he's seen him get his justice he deserves, not quite yet. Rod tells Dupin that he believed he was more like his recently deceased daughter Tam as she once shared a lot of the best traits that Norris has, but over the years he choked it out of her. As he details what happened to the kids after Annabelle left him, he waited till he had enough money to eventually take them away from her by showing them what life would look like by flashing money at them and of course they took it. The money killed any goodwill from them that they got from their mother as we learn that Annabelle couldn't live without them and eventually died of a broken heart. Roderick sees the spirit of Annabelle who's at this funeral to mourn their kids who at one point were once innocent. As we see her sitting in the last row and he walks over to her to talk to her as she tells him what she would tell people if they asked how did he manage to take the kids away she would tell him he was rich. He fooled them with his greed something that she knows she couldn't compete with but she knew he was actually just starving them over and over again so that they kept coming back and needed him to survive to feed his ego which led to their demise. As she looks through this rich man's eyes and sees a poor man as she says to him that maybe their children died at childhood. Cut to the moment Robert came home after betraying August's trust during the trial as Annabelle doesn't know who he's become. Feels like she made up this version of who she thought he was as we see him reciting the Annabelle Lee by Edgar Allan Poe, a poem that explores the theme of the death of a beautiful woman. Cut back to the moment he fell on the ground after episode one as the raven looks down upon him as it is time. Cut back to Dupin wanting the confession from Roderick as we flash back to the night of 1980 shortly before Roderick and his sister Madeline met Verna. They went to the company party first and they're greeted with joy by Rufus who calls Rod his hero and we see the rest of the employees celebrate him after his actions in the trial. Rufus names him his right hand man and already went ahead and shared the news with all the higher ups and also told him that the whole idea of the trial was his own. Anywhere that he goes, Rod's gonna tag along. He has his complete trust, which is exactly what Madeline told him to do. As they give him a special bottle of the wine of Montalano, which is of course the reference to the short story of the cast of Mascalato, which I detailed in my episode 1 breakdown. A story about a man taking fatal revenge on a friend who he believes insulted him. Their plan is in motion, we watch Madeline take him down to the basement as she leads him to thinking she's taking him up on his offer from the last time they met in his office. As she plays hard to get and makes him walk towards her, he realizes he can't walk at all because the wine that he drank was tampered with and he passes out. Cut to him being tied up and Madeline and Rod cementing him behind the wall. As they say this is all for the good of the company, they're personally handling the man with all the crimes from the grave robbing to destroying lives themselves. Rufus has done the legwork to put Roderick in line to replace him as CEO and Madeline as COO as they put the final touches on their you are so small wall. We now know who was behind the wall this whole time and who the jester was who was introduced at the end of episode one. This is the definition to me of a mystery with a perfectly crafted plot payoff as they murdered their first victim and they set their sights on their alibi. Back to their sit down with Verna at the bar as she asked them what they would be willing to do to become who we saw them become throughout this show. As Verna calls them killers and tells them that she knows what they did to Rufus and she knows their whole plan. As they're sitting outside of time and space, she details their future including no legal consequences for their whole life. Luck meets opportunity, but of the cost of the next generation, as the deal is that their bloodline must die, but also they must die together. They chose for the ushers to live a shorter life of having everything they ever could imagine versus a life of agony and pain. Now, just a brief moment, I want to pose this question to you all listening or watching this video. If you were given this exact opportunity, put in the comments right now, what would you do? As they agree to make this deal over drinks, the same ones that Rod had since the start of the conversation with Dupin. They drink to the House of Usher as they walk out and turn around and find that that bar never existed. This is the moment that Rod confesses to Dupin, as after years of that moment happening, they believe that it was all a dream, but shortly after that, that's when they began to build their Usher empire. Cut to seeing Pym at their childhood home to complete his task of locating and handling Verna with full authority to destroy her by any means possible. 
as we see him like a professional poison her and tie her up all for her to reappear seconds later. Laverne has been looking forward to meeting him for a long time as she details his plan and what he was going to do to her. They've met before. Transglobe Expedition. He witnessed murders and didn't do anything about it as she offers him a deal. He must retrieve files that Camille kept on everyone like Batman did to the Justice League members as these files showcase all the wrongdoings that each member of the family has done including Pym himself. Now in return he must give her something that he cares for but we learn he has no wife, he has no kids, He's got nothing to give because he always saw those things as leverage. As we see, he declines and decides to play his own accords as she thanks him and she vanishes. As Lenore helps her grandfather to bed after his fall, she tells him that losing a company is good for him and he should let it go, as it is time for them to put the money they made to work for good. Sounds just like something Annabelle would say. T tells him that it's not too late to fix things, and as we're about to find out, this was the last word she says to him. To Lenore heading to bed and Verna is there waiting for her to complete the deal, as it's the whole bloodline. She tells her that moments like this do not bring her joy. She goes over this future where she tells her a story about her, her mom, will have a tough road of recovery ahead of her but she will endure it and she will actually inherit money from this whole fallout and she's going to actually do good with it she'll start a non-for-profit and she names it after lenore and saves a lot of lives ends up saving millions of lives and lenore did all of this by saving her mother and in return she saved all those lives as vera touches her head and lenore dies as i was watching this moment this is one of the moments that i got emotional because the actress as i'll talk about later that plays lenore played this character with so much love and so much care and it was just such a sad moment let me know how you all felt about the death of Lenore Rod tells Dupin how Lenore died and actually tells him who's been texting him all night as the whole time it's been the AI that Madeline was working on throughout the series and Lenore was the beta test and that's been texting him this whole time she shows him the messages and we see it's never more typed out different times as Rod speaks the famous poem by Edgar Allan Poe the Raven Cut back to his home, we see Rod find Lenore's body as the Raven arrives, as does Lenore, who whispers her own name. We see Rod drive to his real home, which is the Fortunato building, and he walks around the board table to meet his dead bloodline. We see Verna arrives, and she shows him all the people he's killed. Every five minutes, someone dies from his drug as they fall and their bodies rain from the sky. As she tells him to set up the meeting we've been watching between him and Dupin. As we see Madeline arrive to see who's been in the basement this whole time, we see the siblings have been given a moment to talk before things end and you'll notice that Rod doesn't sip any of the drink that he poured for them. As the last few weeks he's been gathering all their important belongings to be buried like pharaohs. They discuss what they've accomplished with this company, why she never had kids, how other companies and governments tear people apart every day, the playbook of men and women having children and passing down their traumas as she continues to drink up. It's them versus the world and death will have to look her straight in the eyes as she realizes he's messed with her drink and she passes out. As we see Rob preparing his sister's body like a goddess and a queen and he sets her up for a tomb for the afterlife. But it appears he didn't make sure she actually died just like he did with their mother as we hear her coming up the stairs as we hear his truth. He knew deep down he knew that he would make it to the top over all the dead bodies and he has no regrets being the last usher standing. As Madeline makes her way up the stairs filled with rage and hate in her eyes which were replaced by those set fires he got for his sister for her birthday her tongue's now missing but she's still yelling with rage as she chokes her brother to death just like their mother did to their father in episode one to me this conclusion to the sibling story was brilliant i believe at one point when they were kids and maybe before killing rufus they actually did love each other but after the greed took over i believe they cared more about the idea of someone loving them after all the things they did versus actually having pure simple love for one another as the pen runs out, as the House of Usher falls to the ground, he sees exactly what Rod said he would, which is seeing the fall of this family, but also he sees the Raven. We end this finale with seeing Dupin taking down all the ushers from his board as he's retired to spend time with his family. We see Juno inherited everything and completely dissolves the company and makes it a company for good. Meanwhile, Pym is arrested after those files were taken by the police as he sees Verna in the crowd. See Dupin visits the usher's grave as he leaves the truth and the confession by Rod at his headstone as he says that he can take this with him. As Dupin walks away as the richest man in the world because he still has his bloodline to spend time with, as the Raven stands stands over the tombstone and looks at him almost like a moment of reflection to value your loved ones because life is short and death is inevitable as he walks away.
As we see the shape-shifting Verna leaving the Usher family material things that they valued more than human lives, the greedy things that ended up driving them to their deaths on each of their headstones. As we end seeing the literal fall of the House of Usher. This was a mini cinematic movie that was art. It felt like it was transcending TV storytelling. Now, of course, this final chapter was based on the legendary poem that many would say made Edgar Allan Poe a household name almost immediately after he published it. The story about a man who lost his love at Belor. A story that represents the grief of losing a loved one and the struggle to overcome it. As we saw Rod losing his family and struggling to overcome losing what he built, the nevermore meaning of not having again or never again. The Usher family killing and abusing the power never again because their bloodline is never more. As Verna the Raven represented an omen of bad luck, also evil and death, she was an ancient being filled with wisdom beyond human understanding. She was intelligent and she also had the ability to adapt and shapeshift as she also had the ability to offer corrupt individuals a sense to completely transform themselves, which a lot of them chose to do evil things with, and it came at a cost. Now, I'll personally have to sit with this series just a little bit longer longer to truly say that I believe that this might be Mike Flanagan's best work to date because I've spent more time and I've watched things like The Haunting on Hill House and Midnight Mass a little bit more and I also consider those to be masterpieces. But I can confidently say that this was one of my favorite experiences with a TV series this year. And I can also say without a question, this was one of the best finales and endings to a series that I've seen this year and honestly one of the best finales I've seen in a very long time. The detail and the precision from the direction and the writing in which the story was told was nothing short of masterful. The performances across the board were phenomenal, even though some of the characters' individual storylines sometimes felt that they were a little bit underwhelming, the performances were still top-notch. Now, my personal standouts being all the performances of Roderick, especially from Bruce Greenwood, what a behemoth of a performance. Madeline Usher, played by Willa Fitzgerald, was a force of nature, as was Mary McDonald. Augie Dupin, what an inspiring and brilliant performance by both Carl Lumley and Malcolm Goodwin. And I thought all the Usher kids were fantastic, but my personal favorite was Kate Siegel as Camille. Gotta love Mark Hamill as his cold and calculated approach to Pym was genius. I love the pureness in which Kylie Corrin brought to Lenore. Now I can go on and on about the supporting characters like Rufus who was an asshole, but what a great performance by that boss, and Annabelle, the pureness and the kindness from her. But I want to end by saying this on the performances. I have been a fan of Carla Gugino for a long time and I've been following her career for a while and I love everything she's done with Mike Flanagan but her role as Verna aka the Raven might just be one of my all-time favorite performances of her great career. She played so many different roles and showed so much range from being nice and kind and caring to cold and terrifying. This was a literal perfect performance for me. Now I spoke on the story and the performances and the direction which was incredibly detailed. Let's talk a little bit about the scares. For me, in my personal taste, I found The Haunting on Hill House was more scarier but this was more brutal and gory and had some very effective jump scares. But again, to each his own, I just personally found The Haunting on Hill House, and you know what I'm talking about, the bent neck lady, that still haunts my dreams. Now, if I had any criticisms, I mentioned it in my individual videos I did for each episode, but some of the characters I wish were more developed or we had more time with them to make it feel more impactful or emotional. For example, I love the fact that the two characters who were tortured the most, and I'm referring to Morelli and and Juno, they were physically tortured a lot throughout this show as they were able to put good into the world and the performances worked, but I wish we would have had more time with them to really make their endings just hit more harder and feel more earned in my personal opinion. Now this isn't really a criticism, but selfishly I would have loved to have spent more time with the actual Usher family together before they all died. More scenes of them maybe being younger or of course with them being more adults because their chemistry to me was just so electric and fun and brought some great moments throughout this show. Overall, the fall of the House of Usher brilliantly connected the classic stories of Edgar Allan Poe and told this modern profound story about this greedy family who let their own selfish desires and dreams take over the parts of life that make you human and filled it with lust, drugs, power, and pain. This was an experience that had an incredible depth and showcased the corrupt nature of this family and was crafted by this genius and the master of horror and suspense and family drama by the name of Mike Flanagan. This concludes my journey of covering every episode of this incredible series. I would like to thank you all for watching this video and a special thanks to those that watched all seven previous breakdowns, which can be found in the description below and on the screen now. 
Consider hitting the like button if you enjoyed today's breakdown and recap and share this video as well as sharing your thoughts on this finale and this series as a whole. And if you like me have seen all the Mike Flanagan Netflix series, which is your favorite, let me know in the comments below. Consider subscribing today. You all are awesome. Stay safe and I'll catch you all on the next video.